The Thriller Zone welcomes Mark Graney, author of The Chaos Agent. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. I think, is this a three-peat or a four-peat? I think it's a four-peat. I feel, I feel like it's four. Yeah. I feel, I feel like we spent a lot of time together, David. Uh, I was noticing in the mirror this morning, you know, between the hair kind of receding a little bit and getting grayer, I'm like, Mark's going to look at me and go, who are you? I just saw you like <laughs> four years ago. You know, yeah, old. yeah. No, I saw you at VoucherCon um, in San Diego, I guess, last fall. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I don't think you had the facial hair then, did you? No, I was just, yeah, I'm mixing it up, doing something um, different. But anyway, as I was thinking about this, I, I went to my hard drive and I said, oh, wait a minute, which folder? One, two, three. oh, gee, I'm on the fourth folder for Mark. Yeah. And then I'm looking at the size of each file and I'm like, man, I've done a lot of work for that guy. I don't know where my residual check is. <laughs> <laughs> All Checks right. in the mail. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Dude, the chaos agent. We're going to spend plenty of time on this. I want to say out of the gate and I've now read, well, you got 13. This makes 13, right? Yeah, it's Baker's, my thir 13th great, great, gray man. Gray man. Yeah. Baker's dozen. And I'm thinking, all right, I I wasn't there at the first because that was several years ago. I joined mm -hmm. you late in the game. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm thinking back, this is the fourth book I've read. Yeah. It's my favorite one yet. Oh, that's great. I, I really love hearing that because uh, the whole year I'm writing it, I'm thinking it's, it's this is going to be the one where I get found out as being a fraud. So uh, the re reception to it's been really good. And, that's you know, it just totally lets a lot of uh, tension out for me. I, I can only imagine, Mark, being in your place in life, uh, having that tension. But I've, I've got it and, I, and I've, I've got specific reasons why it's the I love the slow burn out of the gate. That was a little bit different than some of your books. You you, you sometimes come bounding out of that gate right right but i actually appreciated the slow burn because it let me get inside uh court's head a little bit more we got yeah. a little bit of the the dynamics of the romance side of his life right yeah that's exactly the reason i did it it's like for this story you want to see them trying to stay the hell out of trouble <laughs> at the <laughs> beginning and and you can't stay the hell out of trouble at the beginning without you know with there being you know too much gunplay um, other thing, other machinations are are you know going on, and there is some you know assassinations early in the book. But Court is doing his best to to stay out of it for the first uh, chunk of it, and uh, he's unsuccessful. Otherwise, <laughs> it wouldn't have been much of a book. But at the same time, yeah, that that was the idea. A bit of a bit of a slow burn. The uh, the last book opened with him in a knife fight. Um, next, next to a bomb under 40 feet of water. Um, so this one, you know, I always want to do something different. And I applaud you, Mark. I really do. And I, and a lot of folks will say, well, dude, I read a thriller so that you can get me ripping pages out of the beginning. I'm like, trust me on this folks. Trust me. Yeah. Go along for the ride. Yeah. You, I try and put tension on every page and tension doesn't always mean, you know, things blowing up and people getting killed. You know, there's tension in, you know, conversations and relationships between people and, you know, ticking clocks and all these sorts of things. Um, I want that on every page of the book. So whether or not, there, you know, I was a big uh, Jean Le Carré fan. Nobody writes slower books than Jean Le Carré. And maybe nobody writes more tense books than Jean Le Carré. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's like that's not a backhanded compliment. That's 100% a compliment. I mean, it's, it's magic what he does. And I don't do that. I mean, obviously, my books have an element of diehard and predator in them or whatever. But at the same time, um, you know, I want to I also want to you know, these are big books. So I have time to put a ton of action in and put the psychology in and, and these other developments that are not, you know, that are tense, but not, you know, just straight action. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not going to ruin it, but there's a scene where they're sitting on the balcony and they're trying to hide. They're trying to stay away from the action. He and his girlfriend, they're trying to, you know, blend in and let's just let trouble will find us. Let's not go looking for it. Mm -hmm. And to your point, it's the way that you craft those sentences by it's not he was mad and did it did. It was all the little tiny things that I've really seen this evolution of your writing to where you allow uh, and I hope this is a compliment. I mean it this way, the way you allow the audience to go, 
oh, what is he thinking with that reaction? And what is yeah. she thinking? You know, it's so good. Oh, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah, at the beginning, I wanted so there's some tension. So it's Court is in love for the first time in his life. Um, they've had maybe the best four months of their life since the ends of the last book, but he really feels that this is you know a time is running out on everything going so well. It's uh, his paranoias and you know it's all very well earned. And then you know I, I asked myself if you were an assassin and you were trying to lay low and you finally let your guard down with somebody and then you found out something they said wasn't a hundred percent true regardless of the reasons for it, would you immediately start building the, those walls right back up? And it seems like you would. So I right. wanted to uh, kind of explore that a little bit at the beginning and uh, sort of have that relationship, which seems so perfect, you know, th th him question a little bit, like what's going on here. And I, uh, again, this is a compliment and I don't want to compare you because you're your own guy and your own star that's shining bright, but there's a scene in James Bond and I'm not going to remember which one it was. It's a, certainly D Daniel Craig near the end. It's when uh, Vesper was involved and you saw him fall in love for the first time instead of just, you know, shag a week. And yeah. mm -hmm. then when he found that betrayal, the way he just did a 180 and, and I was getting little memory hits when i was yeah. reading this similar way yeah yeah that's uh, casino royale it's such a good movie yeah, and um you. and it's uh you know i just I, again i just think about like if i was in that position and you know i had all these i have all this history uh, and then there was something that i even something that i didn't understand that the other person said or did uh i would probably just go into you know duck and cover mode and panic a little bit. And I think I wanted to show him doing that. I think in the first draft I actually gave to my editor and he thought I was a little too, like he just thought people would think it was, you know, the gray man's coming off too much like a, you know, a jackass. Um, and I toned it back a little bit and I think he was right for that. I think at first, you know, he was just literally like hitting the bricks and, you know, cussing her out or whatever. And, yeah. and, and now it's, it's a lot more subtle and she explains herself and things move on from there. So Tom Colgan is a good, uh, uh, voice of reason in your ear, isn't he? Absolutely. Yeah. I always say that he, most of the editing he does, he never actually says it out loud. It's just what I, I can hear his voice when I'm, when I write it. Um, he would disagree. He would be like, yeah, there's still a lot of it. <laughs> there's still a lot of things I want to <laughs> tweak in the writing, but, um, no, it's, it, I, this is my 24th published novel and I've done 22 of them with Tom and, um, you know, hope to do 22 more. Yeah. I want to circle back to him in a minute. Cause I, I think the world of him, but I want to, I want to do a little bit of, uh, backup a little bit. And I want to ask, uh, what you've been up to, because I want to take a step back as we come back to the chaos agent. And I realize it's pretty much the same with you. You're either writing a new book or ink in a new Hollywood deal or tending to the wife and kids and growing gaggle of pups. Is that the same now? Is this all pretty much standard operating procedure for you? Yeah, no, nothing interesting has happened. I get, you know, I'm doing a lot of this publicity and a lot of people are like, well, what do you do in your free time? And I'm going like, sit and stare at the wall, I guess, uh, you know, <laughs> have dinner, uh, sleep. Um, so I, I did two books last year. And when I say that, um, it's not exactly accurate because the, the second one, which I was trying to finish before Thanksgiving, I didn't get turned in until late January. And, um, it's, you know, all through the holidays. I mean, I was present for Christmas Day and, and Thanksgiving, I guess. But the, all the rest of the time I was working. New Year's Eve, I was back here in my office till 10 o'clock at night. And um, it's just, you know, I've just been on deadline. The book just came together. The second book, not this one, Chaos Agent, but the, a book I have coming out in June. Uh -huh. um, it, uh, you know, it just came together longer. So, you know, the last uh, year has been tough because, you know, I, I used to just plop down and write 3000 words and and it gets tougher the more you do it and the more things you've already written. You have to think up something new and, uh, you know, you want to keep the stories fresh. So, it you know, to the, the same amount of output takes me a lot longer than it used to. And I just have so many other distractions going on in my sure. life. So so it's, sure. it's tougher than it used to be. It's still once you have the book done the way you want it and you're proud of it, it's it's a it's a great feeling, though. And I have to imagine, Mark, a little bit of the challenge for you is that this book was uh, finished some time ago, already been through all the ringers that needed to go, and you're already on to the next one and even the next one. So for you to take the time to sit down with us and talk about it, 
I'm sure your mind does a little bit of, okay, now what was that? Oh yeah, that's right. That was that plot. Yeah. At the beginning, uh, when, when you start to do the, the press, you know, I have this, like, I don't think about it. I'm like, okay, that'll, that'll, I'll start on Monday or whatever. And then really closely before that you go, okay, wait, what do you know about this book that you turned in last <laughs> September or October? And then you just go, you know, like a lot of times I'll read like people that read the early copies of it and will write right. reviews. I'll read the reviews of it to see what it's about a little bit. Not that I don't know what it's about, but it's just like I've written an entire other book that takes place in West Africa. Couldn't be further from what happens here. And then yeah. I've sort of given a, a thin outline for the next gray man, the 14th gray man. So coming back, it's almost like coming back two books and, um, and, and going back into it, I just had to, I had to refresh a lot of my memories, especially about like artificial intelligence and some of the technological themes and, or ideas in the book. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I spent, I spent a few hours, um, <laughs> preparing for, <laughs> for the onslaught of, uh, questions. Well, I'm going to jump to AI in just a second, but do you still have uh, somewhere there in front of you your little cheat sheet? Because you said this to me a show or two ago where you said, I got a little cheat sheet just to make sure I'm, where is it? <laughs> That's not it, David. Stand by. There's more. Oh, my God. <laughs> a little light on there just in case. And then that ought to do it. Oh, and the thing is, I, I don't even really look at it um, because if, looking at it's a little distracting. And so yeah. far, I haven't needed it. It's just the way that I sort of manage stress. You know, it's like if, if I'm fumbling for a word, I can always like go. I think it's on here somewhere. <laughs> um, but so far, I don't. I don't really think I've had to, I've had to look at it. Yeah. If it makes you feel any better, everybody thinks that I do all this show off the top of my head, but I have an entire screen right here with all of my notes for you. So that if, if I ever go blank and dude, that goes, uh, happens more and more. Yeah. I just celebrated a birthday. So I realized, oh, that's where that stuff is going. I'd rather be prepared and not need it than not prepared and need it. Sure. Sure. And speaking of that, there's something I've always wanted to ask you, and I can't believe I've never have. And and it's it's going to seem silly to you for a second, but the brackets around Gray Man, and I and I want to make sure I made a point. This started on day one, I think. And and where did that come from? And whose idea was that? The little brackets. Well, it's def. I, I have no idea. It's definitely the art <coughs> department um, at Berkeley, and they're so so good. They've really done a great job. I think what it's supposed to represent is um, what's called a bounding box. When you're uh, electronic surveillance on something, it, it will put up like an automatic. I, I guess that's what it is. I'm not even Got sure it. if they know that. But um, every year when like one of the most fun times of the year is when they show me the cover for my next book. And it's usually I haven't even written it. I've just sort of told my editor what it's going to be about. So they're like, you know, that's Cuba on the cover of that one. So I told them that this. The location was in Cuba. It involves robotics and stuff. So they went from there and the color scheme and, and the, everything is, is just amazing. Yeah, I'm going to put this up on the screen so that I, it's a better picture. But uh, this is my favorite cover to date. And, you know, I'm a, a big fan of yeah. tasty covers. And I think it's the opposition of the colors of the purplish blue and the orange. And then you have, of course, court hidden inside of your mm -hmm. name, but it's, and then that drone flying by, I didn't catch that until about the third time I looked at it. And yeah. I was like, God bless America. That's a good one. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, so thank you for an answering that question. I want to say, um, uh, I want to reiterate for a second as we dive into the little bit, this is easily my favorite book yet. And I, for so thank many you. reasons, I started off with the romance and then the the way that you bring in technology. And I want to drill down on AI in our time that we've got left. And I, it's that slow burn and the AI influence because that is all the rage now. You can't even turn around without hearing AI this, AI that. Well, besides the nonstop action. But I want to ask, how is the AI influencing your topic of conversation these days? And Matter of fact, what's the best way to describe how it plays a role in Chaos Agent? Well, um, you know, it, it, doing this press tour that I've been doing, I, after each interview, I, I kind of like self-reflect and go, man, you sound like such a Debbie Downer. <laughs> You've got to bring the mood up a little bit <laughs> because, you know, it, the first thing I'll say is that when I went into this and I chose artificial intelligence and these big commercial labs with the, where the billionaires are, are developing the future. Um, I 
you know, kind of asked myself, you know, like, well, what do you think about this? And and then the the more I dug into it, the more I dug into it, the scarier it was. And, um, you know, it wasn't hard to find, you know, potential villains or at least someone you could fictionalize as a villain. Writing the story is when you do all your research, you come up with an idea first. And then when you're writing, you know, I do my research while I'm writing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, I was just learning so much. I was getting so much information. And a lot of it's kind of scary about, you know, where things are going in the future as far as artificial intelligence. And, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but, but you know, I, I keep telling myself, well, look, you went into this um, purposely looking for the dark side of artificial intelligence. So <laughs> it, it can do a lot of really great things. So, you know, cure cancer or, or whatever that's on the horizon that it will do. It can also do some some pretty awful things. And um the way that the technology has exploded and exploded, it is, uh, it's, it's ominous for anybody that looks at, at the downside of it. So I, uh, you know, I wanted to incorporate it into the story as realistically as possible. It's so important for people to understand this is not science fiction. This is all existing or emerging technology. And I really hope people will just go on Google and type in Boston Dynamics Atlas and look at the bipedal robot that's like a human that can do backflips and you can do stuff you can't do and you can't knock it down. Or, you know, the uh, the the robot dogs with the 6.5 Creedmoor rifle on their backs and the the hexacopter drones that can drop the, that can land on a rooftop and drop the uh, the robot dogs with the guns on their back off and let them go. So, you know, there's there's so much out there in the world that is existing technology. And a lot of these things are remotely piloted now by a human being. But artificial intelligence is getting smarter and smarter and smarter. You know, it's ace the SATs and the the bar exam. So anybody that says, you know, anybody who feels let down by chat GPT when you ask it to write you a a letter or something, um, It is sophisticated in other ways, and uh, it's also in its infancy. So, you know, God knows where we're going to be in five years. And to that chat GPT reference, uh, most I think I I think I'm safe to say that your average bear is uh, working around in the realm of that three point five. Well, there's a four, four point five. There's a five. There's a seven on a horizon. And it only exponentially gets smarter along the way, which is the. Good point and the bad yeah. point to your point. What scared me the most, perhaps, in this uh, story was when the the drones have the ability to target, th- react um, autonomously in some way, think faster on the fly, have no emotion attached, and take out targets at an unconscionable distance. Yeah. When you start thinking about that and back to your dropping the robot dogs and so forth, it gets scary fast. Yeah. A lethal autonomous weapon is a weapon that's able to uh, make its own decision on who to kill. <laughs> so you have this thing called the OODA loop that everyone in the military talks about. It was invented by a uh, an Air Force pilot uh, named John Boyd. Um, and it's OODA, Observe, Orient, decide and act. So any gunfighter, any, anybody in a tactical situation, anyone in a, in a military situation knows about the OODA loop. Um, this is how you, this is how you fight. You, you observe something, you orient yourself to that thing, you decide what you're going to do and then you act upon it. Well, if there's a human on the loop as, as like an ultimate circuit, circuit breaker, then that decide part, that OODA, the D um, is handled by a human, but with artificial intelligence, they have weapons that can do it all. So the, the, the weapons actually making the decision, you know, it's able to discriminate against targets and then say, I'm going to kill that target. And there is all sorts of, uh, you know, everything I've read, there's, there's so many ways that that can go wrong. Um, even if you, even if you programmed in the rules of war, they they would still, you know, kill civilians or, or, or whatever. So, it's uh, it's danger and it's coming. Um, you know it's coming because Sun Tzu uh, said Art of war. S- speed. Yes, speed is the essence of war. And so someone, uh, uh, let's say China, takes their humans out of the loop and they're able to fight wars at machine speed, thousands of computations a second. Um, at that point, even though you know we morally and ethically have decided we're always going to keep you know, human machine teams, as, as they like to say in the defense department, 
Right. Um, you know, the moment the other guy is able to make 2000 decisions a second with every one of their weapons plat platforms and everything can be cognitized. They say anything that can be electrified can be cognitized in the future. So think about that. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a lot to like be worried about. And, you know, the story is not a high tech story. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's this technologies involved because I think it's, it's interesting and it's important, but you know, you don't need a, you know, a mathematics degree to understand my books because I don't have one either. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an action, you know, high octane shoot them up, but at the same sure. time, all this stuff is going on. And I, and I wanted to, you know, explain it and, and craft it in a way that makes sense to people. Well, I find it really interesting that so many of uh, our mutual friends in the writing community are all up in arms when AI comes up with, with this. This is their very first worry. AI is going to replace us writers. And I'm like, AI will enhance your writing experience, perhaps expedite your writing experience, influence your writing experience. But the cognitive portion of it, the the emotional attachment and that that sense of realism can't be duplicated to quite the degree. Right. I, I think that's true. Um, I also think. You know, so recently it came out that uh, ChatGPT had culled all this information from bootleg books on Google because everybody's books, mine included, you can find them bootlegged on um, online. And so I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of books that it read. And so you can go in ChatGPT and say, write a 2000 word short story in the style of Mark Graney about a man and a butterfly and a, you know, whatever, a pencil. <laughs> and uh it's probably not gonna be that good. Uh, and, and the way I'm writing books, eventually I will get to that plot. So just stand, <laughs> just stand by. That won't take too long. But um, yes, so it is it's definitely this thing where people in the in the writing community were were like, oh my god, they because you can see whose books were used, and I think they use like nine of my books or eleven of my books, and uh, and people were going like, this is so fair, unfair. We're gonna sue. Blah blah blah. And people would ask me for my opinion on it. And I kept going, yeah, this isn't the worst thing that AI is going to do to me <laughs> in, the, in the future. <laughs> it's like, I'd, I'd love to be up in arms about this. But frankly, uh, I'm, I'm worried about a, uh, you know, a world ending event from all this. So I'm not going to be too fired up because they, it read mission critical uh, yeah. or something like that. It is funny how the fear factor, for lack of a better term, uh, arises in some ways that you're like, dude, there are way more scary things that are in, on the horizon than who's going to steal your idea for a book. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Although yeah. I will say one thing I find, find ironic and sort of funny is everybody thought automation and artificial intelligence would replace truck drivers, uh, you know, store clerks, things like that. And meanwhile, it's going up at, you know, it's trying to create poetry and, and paintings, you know, with the generative AI, the, the visual stuff, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's doing all this other stuff. And it's like, wow, it's going after a, a different set of people that everyone sort of imagined because, you know, everybody thought by now there would be, you know, automatic trucks driving people everywhere and we wouldn't need truckers. But now it's like it's it's, um, you know, your AI is writing poetry. It's not delivering your your lunch. So it's it's interesting how we we have notions about how things are going to work and, and can be wrong. Yeah, it's creating St. Bernard's writing a surfboard uh, carrying a birthday cake. Yeah, exactly. In, in photorealism. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, OK, spend your time there. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if that's uh, something you need, then that's <laughs> something you get. You know, one of the things I love uh, about reading a chaos agent and and now, that, especially since uh, my uh, bromance crush on Ryan Gosling is alive and well, um, when you get to see him play court gentry in a movie and then you say he does it so well and you're like, oh, yeah, he is court gentry. Then when you pick up the next book and you have him in your mind, you're like. Yeah, that's my buddy, Ryan. I mean, uh, Court doing the role, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I liked him for the role because he wasn't, you know, big action star. He wasn't, you know, the Schwarzenegger of the 2020s or, or whatever. Right. Um, and, and that's how I write the character. And then when I saw him perform the role, you see that he's the character is just like aggravated and annoyed and doesn't want to be here. And when when he gets hurt, 
it really bugs the crap out of him that it gets hurt. And that's always how I've written him. You know, it's like yeah. he takes a lot of battle damage, but nobody can say that, um, you know, I just gloss over the battle damage. You know, I have him getting stitches. I have him breaking into, you know, <laughs> medical facilities and, uh, you know, always in pain and always, you know, like trying to manage a wound while, while doing something else. And I thought um, Gosling, and I don't know how he did it. I never talked to him about it. I, I did talk to the Russo brothers about, you know, how I saw the character. So he either got that from the screenplay or he got that from the pages of my book or he got that from the Russo brothers. But I mean, it couldn't have been, you know, I, I couldn't have crafted it, it better on screen than they did. And I love that one scene. I won't spend too much time on it, but I love that one scene where he's, a t he's, shackled to the park bench in the middle of that square mm -hmm. and he's like oh really this yeah. is gonna happen this yeah. is how you know that that throwaway oh geez i'm and it's not like i'm a superhero i should and yeah. it's like oh god how am i gonna get out of this and i love yeah. that <clears throat> Yeah, from the beginning, I've always wanted to write him to where he's just barely getting through every single scrape. So every now and then, I'll get an email from somebody that's like, well, he's supposedly the best assassin in the world, and he's all, always almost getting killed. I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to make this story interesting. If you want to read a story where, you know, RoboCop just goes through and kicks everybody's ass and, and you know, nothing bad ever happens to him and he never makes it, you know, it, I'm sure there's, I'm sure that book's out there, but it's not really sure. what I wanted to write from the beginning. Yeah. Are you aware if Ryan will continue playing this much like Matt Damon did with Jason Bourne? That's the idea. They've written another script. Um, Steve McFeely wrote it. Uh, one of the writers of the first uh, Gray Man, but also uh, writ had written several of the MCU films. Um, and uh, and I met him at the premiere, talked to him for a while. And so, yeah, they, they've, they've announced it. It's going to happen. They haven't announced when it's going to happen. Um, Gosh, Ryan Gosling's only gotten like 10 times more famous in the past two years since it came out. So I don't know if it's a schedule thing. I know he's involved in a lot of stuff, but yeah. um, I, I hope to hear something pretty soon. And I, and I will hear about it the same way everybody else will hear about it. The last time sure. when it was announced on Netflix with Gosling and Chris Evans, I had not heard one thing about Chris Evans. I heard that Netflix was interested. I heard that the Russo brothers were wanting to do it. I'd heard that Gosling was circling the project, which... You know, right. in the, the 12 years it was in Hollywood, every actor you can imagine was circling the project. So it just didn't mean anything. And then and then it just showed up on deadline that they were doing this two hundred million dollar movie. And um, and I learned the same time everybody else did. And I'll probably that'll probably be the case again. See, I love these inside scoops because everybody thinks, oh, you know, Mark has his own uh, chair on the set with his name on it. And he yeah. probably gets that. He has espressos delivered to him by hand every 22 minutes. And yeah. uh, he, he's got the inside, uh, inside scoop on everything. Yeah, I'm freaking out about next year's book. That's always gonna, That's always <laughs> what I'm doing. And when I'm publishing this book, I'm freaking about out about what I'm doing next. So uh, everybody that thinks, you know, I, I, I kind of have this joke with my wife that when I, when I go to an event and, you know, meet people, I look at a, at a, at a room of a hundred people and, and go, there's 10 people in here that can't wait to come up here and tell me what they want me to do with my free time because everybody wants me to read their book or this or that. And it's like, you don't really understand. I'm not glorifying the fact I'm busy. That doesn't make me important that I'm busy. Right. It's just sort of like I'm chaotically slammed, you know, just trying to make it through my day. And people are like, yeah. you know, it'd be really great for you to start an organization of writers in the local community. And then you guys could have a meetings and then you could bring in, and, and I'm going like, yeah, you know, you come to all my signings. So two a year, 25 books in, in 15 years. It's like, I don't know. I, I don't really have time for, you know, every other thing. I, I get asked to read somebody's book probably five days a week, five times a, a week. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm always like, are you, are you asking me for a couple of weeks of my free time? Cause that's what it takes me to, to read a book in my free time. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll do it some, but 95% of the time I can't do it. And every now and then people just get mad and then they're just like, you know, Oh, I can't believe you're not giving back to the community. And I'm like, I, I do give back. <laughs> I just can't, I just can't only give back. Cause I'm trying to write 2000 words a day. Yeah. And, um, 
not to make it about me, but I find myself um, getting bombarded. I've got stacks and stacks of books. I'm sure. Who want to get on the show. And Mm -hmm. listen, if I had my way, I would create an AI chip in my head to where I could just speed read every single book and then just crank out podcast after podcast. And then I get an occasional, I got one this week, a guy going, really? Dude, I've been banging on your door for a year. And I'm like, I got five people that's been banging on my door yeah. for two years, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just a fact, you know, that it's like, there's just a, a lot going on and you, everybody's doing their best and uh, you know, it's, you can't really judge people. Um, you know, like I understand people asking the question or I'll have, I'll have somebody send me an email about something. And then when I don't respond in two hours, they're like, Oh, did I do something to offend you? And you're going like, Whoa, man, I had, I've got, <laughs> 60 or 80 people that are that are hit me right now and I'm I'm doing my best. <laughs> anyway, this is not Weiner's corner. This is just <laughs> simply <laughs> this is just little facts of life, yeah. folks. I do want to ask this. Uh, it's interesting from the writer's perspective, what do you suppose uh because you've written so many books as we've just covered, the difference and the strongest challenge maybe that's a better way, between writing Gray Man and Tom Clancy. And I understand that they're two entirely different worlds, but I'd love to know just from the writer's perspective, what's the strongest challenge, biggest difference between those two worlds for you, creating them? That's a good question. Um, Yeah, I always said I never really had a trouble going back and forth between the two. They were different enough to where it felt like a different world. Um, the Clancy books are, are so big and broad and there's so many, I, I, I guess the answer to your question is in the Clancy books, there's a certain cast of characters that sort of need to be in all the books because people want it to see them. And I get that too. I'm a Clancy fan. I, I want to see them too. And if sure. I picked up Mark Cameron's new book or, or MJ Woodard or, uh, Andrews and Wilson, the people doing Clancy now, and I picked one of those books up, I would want to see what John Clark is doing or, you know, uh, Jack senior is doing, sure. but I made a, I made a decision in the gray man early on that my recurring characters, my sidekicks and, you know, second tier characters would come and go and not, you know, I didn't have to check the box on each book to have them all in sure. and in the, the Clancy world. Again, I'm not knocking it. That's exactly how you should do it. If, if these people are so, you know, these characters are so beloved and, and, you know, people have been looking at it for, 30, almost 40 years, you need to have them in there. But for the gray man, I wanted, uh, I wanted Zoya to appear in a book and then not be in a book and Zach to be in a book or not be in a book, depending on how I wanted that story to go. So I do hear from fans sometimes they're like, well, there's no Zach in this book. And, um, and I, th- but I think I'm thinking of the long-term health of the series and I didn't want to get into, you know, you have this cast of characters that all need a, need a role. I'd rather, pull the characters in who I, who worked for the story. So I think that was the big thing with the Clancy thing. It, it was, it was just tough because it's like, all right, what is Dominic Caruso doing right now? And um, it, you know, and, and I think that it, it lends itself to those stories because they are big and broad. You can't have this wide group of characters, but in the gray man, I wanted it to be a little bit more. The camera is on court's shoulder <laughs> for the majority of the time. Right. And you know, the, the person who helps keep you, keeps that world in order is someone we mentioned earlier. And I want to take 60 seconds on our friend, Tom Colgan, because lifetime editor of yours, practically Mm -hmm. uh, having spent time with him on the show, I have found him to be one of the funniest and most engaging men I've ever met. Yeah. He's, he's super entertaining. (laughs) He's way funnier than I ever would have expected. I don't know why you think an editor, Oh, it's nuts and bolts, young man, nuts and bolts. <laughs> but then that is not the case with Tom. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you two worked together? And and you you gave me a hint of it, 20 books back. And what, in your opinion, so is that a check? It is. It is 20, isn't it? Uh, 22. 22. 22. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what, in your opinion, makes a good editor? I mean, outside of the obvious. You know, I'm, I'm going to come at this from a very biased angle because I'm the writer. But like to me, a good er- editor is somebody who's there when you need them and then um, lets you do your own thing. You know, he, he Tom will Tom will trust me to try something. He'll tell me what he thinks of it once I try it. But, um, you know, it would be tough. I, I would be a not as good a writer if I wrote everything in my books 
you know, thinking I had to have it approved before I even tried it. So, sure. um, Tom is, I just have these amazing moments where I'm so confused and I'm so lost and these books don't, I, I'm not just a pantser that just, you know, from day one to the next just discovers, um, I don't know. Do you know John Land? Uh, oh yeah. Oh a yeah. Great guy. I love John Land, but I was on a yes. panel with him the other day and he was talking about how he writes and I was like, I need that dude's brain in my head right now um, because he, he can just pants it and, and, and write it out. And I'm like a stressor and freaking out and, and don't think it's good. And, and so I can go to Tom and be, and it's almost like, I don't even, I don't even know how to ask the question, you know, because I'm so confused about something in the story and I can work it. And Tom will work it through. And it, it's always where I feel like I came up with the answer after talking with him, but I only yeah. came up with the answer because we were, we were going back and forth. He's coming up with, you know, the majority of it. So I think that's a super, the amazing skill of an editor is to have the relationship that the writer needs. And, and for me, you know, I need somebody to come to during freakouts and I need somebody that's going to give me freedom to try something. And what I give him is when he comes back and says, this totally doesn't work. He wanted uh, me to change the end of one of the gray man books. And I completely did not understand, but I do understand now um, not change the whole end, but just the, you know, the, the, the little epilogue of where they're going next type of thing. Sure. Um, and I totally, I totally got it later, but I didn't get it at the time. Um, it, yeah. So w what I give to him is I listen to his, you know, he'll come back and be like, yeah, I think you should do this. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know that I believe this motivation or whatever. I mean, I, I take that stuff to heart because he only does it, you know, when he, he, he knows his stuff and he doesn't, you know, do it every paragraph. It's only when he does it, I know to sit up and, and pay attention. That's the thing. There's the magic key is being able to trust him to, to, to know that, look, He's seen it all. He's read it all. Yeah. So if he's going to jump in and he knows how you work, he's not going to come in and go, well, I'm just going to show you I know what I'm doing. You know, mm -hmm. he's going to go, all right, sparingly, uh, I think you got something better that you can do right here. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what he does. And he, and he does it really, really well. And, um, you know, I, I turned in a book that I didn't feel comfortable with the first draft. And he read it and he came back and he's like, you know, you're worrying about nothing. It's really, really good. The pace is great. I was concerned about the pace and at different parts. And, uh, and then I took that from him and I was like, all right, he's wrong. It's still a mess, <laughs> but he's telling me to relax <laughs> for the next yeah. draft and, and move on. And so I wrote another draft and now I feel good about the book, but it, you know, it's sort of like, instead of him coming back and going like, yeah, man, you're right. This is, this is a disaster. It wasn't a disaster. I was exaggerating things, but it wasn't where it needed to be. And instead of him coming back and stating the obvious to me, you know, we've worked together for so long. He knows that I really do make changes and fix things up on, on subsequent drafts. So, yeah. um, you know, but it, but it's nice to take the steam out of the kettle by have him going, all right, I've read it. I like it. You know, keep going. <laughs> This is one of the funniest things I have learned about you over the years is that you, like several people who have been on the show, and you especially, for someone as talented as you are, and I'm not just blowing smoke up your skirt, but to do this volume of work, it's so funny to watch you still neurose over this when you know you've got it in the bag. And maybe actually psychologically that's a great thing because if you weren't worrying it's like the people who don't get nervous before a really big event you go why are you not nervous this is really huge is yeah. it that you don't care you've taken it for granted or whatever anyway anyway that's one thing i've always admired about you and i i find it so funny to this day thank you you know i always feel like there should be a better work-life balance where you know i come in here just fired up and knowing that i've got this and uh trusting that i'll think think it up on the day and it's not like that. It's sort of like when I can't figure something out in my story, which, I mean, if you think of it, a 170,000 word book, like the chaos agent, you're making more than 170,000 decisions. You're deciding every word you don't write. You're deciding what uh, point of view, you know, <laughs> your plot twists and all that. You're making a million decisions to write a book. And if there's something that I can't figure out, it's like, well, why would this character, you know, need this device so much that he's willing to, you know, kidnap the other guys, children for it. You know, like what, what's the point of that? I'll sit there and labor over that when I'm working out, when I'm walking my dogs, when I'm eating dinner, um, you know, I'm out, out at the grill um, and I'll do it at the computer. And I don't trust myself that, you know, 
some morning I'm just going to wake up. My eyes are going to like launch open. I'd be like, Eureka. You know, that it doesn't really happen. I, I sort of solve things in stages after lots and lots of like tooling over it and working over it. And so, um, you know, I'm always happy. I'm happy with every book that I've finished, but I'm yeah. happy with none of my books when they're about 95% done because <laughs> there, there's so many little things that I, I still have to work out. So I think that keeps, keeps me humble because I always feel like I'm about five minutes away from being discovered as, as <laughs> a complete fraud. That is so funny to me. Now, here's an interesting question. When you're sitting at the dinner table, do Allison and the kids, do they uh, go, uh, Mark, uh, come back? Come back. Where, where'd you go? Because uh, maybe during dinner you're working on something. Yeah, Allison does for sure. Not so much sitting there. It, it, there'll be that thing like, what are you thinking about a lot? You know, and it's sure. like, I don't know what other guys are thinking about, but I, you know, I'm thinking about like, how are they going to get the bomb on that boat? You know, and, and, <laughs> and that goes on all the time. There's a hilarious thing that happened to me a long time ago. And it's, it, it'd been funnier if you were there. But um, my, when my nephew was really young, he's 19 now, but he was probably like five and he was over at my house with my brother and sister-in-law and he had a couple of toys and one of them was like, he had a metal air force one. And then he uh -huh. had this like black metal limousine and he was doing this flying thing and putting one on the other. He was just playing, you know, he was, he was three or four. And yeah. my brother, Trey was like, look at Mark. He's sitting there going like, wait, do that again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like what you got there. Let's as if I was going to take that idea of like landing, um, driving a car onto the back of air force one or, or vice right. versa, but it was funny. I mean, it's it, people can sort of see that I'm always trying to like glean stuff out of stuff. Yeah. When Tammy and I first got together, we'd be taking road trips out to see the kids in Colorado and it would be silent for a long time. And I'd just be sitting there driving. This is me driving, by the way. Yeah. She'd go, let me guess working on a character. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering how he was going to break out of prison if he only yeah. had blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's so yeah. hilarious. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, something I noticed, uh, at the end as we're getting ready to wrap up, I noticed that your acknowledgements, this is probably the shortest acknowledgements. Oh, that on makes any... me sound bad. <laughs> makes no, no, no. Sound like I don't appreciate anyone. <laughs> no, what I'm getting at is I have read a couple of books recently where their acknowledgements were nearly a novella. Jack Carr. <laughs> It, I wasn't going to say it. No, I mean, I think it's, it's like I read it and I'm going like, man, you've you've written a, you've written a whole nother book. It's like <laughs> I, I, I'm always so late with my acknowledgments um, because I'm late with the book and I'm late with my edit. You know, I'm just I'm always just scrambling. And then the acknowledgments, I've honestly forgotten to put people in there who are who are like real important. I'll put them in the next book that they had nothing to do with. It's just merely an observation. There's no judgment. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. care. You know, I just found it so interesting because, and I, I'm so glad that you named out our mutual friend Jack Carr because I was mm -hmm. like, Jesus, Jack, Jack, that's an that's an entire epilogue right there. Yeah, he's he's put me in his acknowledgments. I'm like, what I do, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, like we're friends. So yeah, I want to I want to ask you this: Who would you say has had um, perhaps the strongest influence as you mentioned Jack Carr. And I think of, all, I watch you and a bunch of your buddies on social media, hmm. what do you think has been the strongest influence on your writing career to date? Uh, I mean, definitely Tom, my editor, sure, <laughs> but sure. as far as other writers, probably Josh hood. I don't know if you've oh. had him on before, but, um, oh yeah. uh, Josh and I are really good friends. We go shooting together. Um, we're always talking about stuff. He, he you know, when he's uh, standing on a, um, you know, like on, on a, on a bench with a, a noose around his neck, he calls me and vice versa. I do the exact same thing to him. And he just read uh, the second half of a book that, that I was working on that I was not happy with. And boom, just idea after idea. He's, he's got a great mind for that. Um, Brad Taylor's a good friend of mine and we talk about the business and, and, you know, like, all this other stuff. And so it's, that's, that's also very helpful for me. Um, yeah. I, I have a good relationship with everybody. I, there's really nobody in the industry that I don't get along with. There's people that I don't get to see enough. Um, and then when you do, you go to like one or two conferences a year and you're yeah. there for four days and you have 15 things to do and uh, you have 50 people you want to hang out with. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, jo Josh would be the one that is like, he's, He's, uh, he's given me like great ideas and, you know, we've talked through, uh, you know, like difficult things. So probably Josh. Okay. Well, you know, <clears throat> you were reminding me that he was on the show once and I need to bring him back because he is, I did not know he was such a prolific ghostwriter as well. 
Yeah, yeah, he's done ghostwriting. Super smart guy, SWAT, um, uh, airborne office, uh, airborne. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess the hundred and first. He's he's in the eighty second. I'm there. You I, go. I don't know one or the other. Uh, yeah, great guy, great guy. All right, there's two more things I want to do before we wrap out of here because I know you got a, a deadline to meet. We've done this before. You know, it's my standard closing uh, question. I do it every single show for every author. It's best writing advice for aspiring writers. I know yours has been pretty consistent all along, but sometimes I find over the years the advice shifts a little bit. So I want to check in on Mark's best writing advice. Mm, the best one I'll give right now is the single most important thing you need when you start a project uh, in this genre. I can't speak to other genres, um, and it probably is different, is intimately know what your villain wants. I mean, mm. I feel like I can build everything out from there. If, if I have, you know, an antagonist with with some wants and some goals, then I can I can go from there. I can I can plug the the good guy in to try and thwart the ideas. I mean, obviously, characters are super important because if people don't care about the characters, um, then you're you're completely dead in the water. But the the initial thing, like if I was sitting down, I've never written a book. I was sitting down. I wanted to write. I, you know, I, I, I can write, but I, you know, had never. I have no plans for a book. I would be like, wh who's my bad guy, and what what do they want? Or honestly, yeah. what do they want? And then I'll figure out who it is. Uh, you yeah. know, once you have that initial thing, you can you can expand on that and expand on it and expand on it, and eventually you have a story for for a chaos agent. I was looking at people like Elon Musk, you know, these multi-billionaires that have these massive AI labs and the Defense Department wants to work with them. And, you know, Chinese wants to steal their material or, or you know, create their own versions of things. And I just thought, wow, that this nexus between, you know, business and ego and greed and, and ambition and military's necessities and all the money that's involved, it's like, wow, that's so rife for trouble. It's like, well, what if some entity had developed uh, an artificial intelligent agent that was able to be completely weaponized as a, um, a almost like uh, an intelligence agency? It's attached mm -hmm. to offshore banks so it can buy people and, and order things and ship things and... Uh, you know, socially engineer people. And I just thought like, wow, that is, that's like an incredible device. Now, how does my hero factor into it? And, you know, you expand from there and you, and you turn this initial kernel of an idea, which was, you know, that's, you could write that in a paragraph and you turn that into a 170,000 word book six months later. Folks, did you hear that? There's a little master class for you. <laughs> Nicely done. Thanks. All right. Only because it's you, and I kind of have stopped doing this because people or uh, attention spans are shortening, but I, you know that thing I do, random fire questions? Mm -hmm. I, I got three of them real fast. Yep. Kind of funny. I want you to play with me, will you? All right. I'll, all right. I'll try. Been all right. Here you go. Number one, you've been asked to compete with Jack Carr, Don Bentley, and Brad Taylor in a shooting contest. Who of the four will perform the best, and who's going to come in last? Uh, Brad Taylor will come in first. First, Jack Carr would be right there. I would come in last. <laughs> Bentley would probably shoot better than me, although he's an officer. Um, there, you know, there are people joke that officers that you can't shoot, but um, I'm not an officer. They also <laughs> joke about people who aren't officers who can't <laughs> shoot. So, um, yeah, I, I would, uh, I would handle the weapon safely. I would hit my target. I would do everything right. I would just do it at a glacial pace. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> that, that's how I am. So I think okay. Brad or Jack would win, one or the other, and. Uh, and then Don would be right behind him. And then I would, I'd bring up the rear. Okay. And fair enough. Number two, you've just learned that part of a future film deal hinges on your performing in a scene as part of your former hard rock band, bad English. Will you a play drums like you did in the eighties B sing as lead vocalist or say no freaking way and pass on the entire deal. I'd play drums and uh, hopefully they have some good CGI or, or whatever special <laughs> effects because I can't play like I used to. I have a, I have a drum set now and um, it's always frustrating because it's like, God, I used to be so good at it and it just feels foreign to me. But, oh, my God, I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, yeah, I, okay. I would, I'd need something done with the hair. I, I guess they could handle that. Which leads me to number three, addendum. 
You lose a bet with your wife, Allison, and she asks you to grow your hair long again, complete with perm. You lose <laughs> the bet. Yes or no? <sighs> yeah, it's like my stepkids. It's the funniest thing in the world. When, when they see me wearing like makeup and long hair and a perm, um, they just die laughing. Like they send it to their <laughs> friends, you know. And I, I'm like, hey, laugh all you want. But in 1987, that worked. You know, that was working for me. <laughs> um, golly, no, there's no way I would. There's no way I would I would do a perm again. I don't care. I would I would uh, I'd have to I'd have to pay her in jewelry or something. OK, fair enough. Well, I am going to be featuring the photograph that I have of you. Um, oh, you have, and, uh, you have one. That's fine. I, I, you know, it's like. I, I can laugh at myself. And again, I will say in 87, I was doing just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sporting the do. Yeah. Love it. All right. Well, folks, the book, of course, again, is The Chaos Agent and the website, if you want to learn more, markgrainybooks.com. Mark, as always, just a thorough pleasure. Well, it's great to see you, David. Thank you for having me back. Hopefully we can do it again. I'm expecting to see you around cranking out books for decades to come, brother. <laughs> I hope so. Thanks a lot. Your front row seat to the best thrillers. The thrillers on.